All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. So I have the uh, honor uh, of, and the burden, I guess, of going last uh, after a day and a half of uh, extremely smart people talking uh, about this topic. And so uh, a lot of the points that I'm going to raise today have come up over the course of the last day and a half at various points, and hopefully I'll be able to acknowledge those when they do. Um, so in some ways, um, uh, you know, this talk, with, while uh, hopefully adding some new insights, will also uh, uh, be a uh, a capstone uh, to a, an interesting day and a half of conversation. And I want to thank the National Academies um, for uh, pulling this together and in particular for inviting me uh, to join. So my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm a primary care doctor um, and a lawyer and I run a research group called the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics and Law, um, which is an interdisciplinary research group that focuses on trying to apply um, empirical uh, um, uh, techniques to uh, answer questions about pharmaceutical policy issues. Um, Amit, who is uh, one of the organizers today and was here yesterday, is, um, uh, also helps me run the group. And um, we're among the largest, if not the largest, um, independent uh, research groups in the country um, focused on this uh, topic. And this is my disclosure slide where uh, the group gets some of our funding from. Uh, I think these sorts of disclosure slides should be standard uh, among people giving talks, even at, at these kinds of uh, events. but. Um, we get a lot of our funding from, from um, private foundations and from the government, and uh, nobody in our group gets any personal uh, support from any um, pharmaceutical company. So um, we're here today to talk about, uh, um, or we've been talking about today and yesterday, a, a fundamental dilemma, um, which is that you know, drugs are among the most effective and cost-effective interventions in medicine, um, and the drug industry plays an important role in bringing these products forward which includes the um, investment of substantial resources. Um, however, at the same time, um, there is also substantial public investment in drug discovery that leads to many of the most transformative drugs that we have. And in fact, and I don't think this, this point has really been um, emphasized enough over the last day and a half, the public investment occurs at this an early stage time where there is the most risk and where uh, private investment is unlikely and unwilling uh, to actually get involved. Um, and, but ultimately, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, what happens is that the entity that controls the intellectual property on these products uh, in the U.S. can then now charge whatever the market will bear, um, which leads to drug prices that makes uh, these breakthroughs unaffordable to patients and to payers um, and leads to major financial and fiscal burdens um, and bad clinical consequences. Um, we did some work uh, looking at this question uh, a few years ago. We did a, a survey of, uh, of physicians around the country in 12 different specialties and asked them what the most transformative drugs were that emerged in their disciplines in the last 25 years. Um, and then what we did was we examined each drug's development history, um, looking at primary sources, interviewing the, uh, the, the scientists, um, both in, in uh, academic and industry settings that were involved in bringing these products forward, um, looking at the patents and the, the, the original research articles. Um, and then we published our, our results in Health Affairs um, a few years ago. And what we found was that of these transformative drugs, the majority of them were based uh, on substantial drug development work, um, not only discovery work, but actually also development work at, in academic medical centers um, prior to phase two pre-approval trials, at which point um, the, uh, there was um, much more industry involvement. Um, and a lot of this development and discovery work happened with government support, although, of course, in many cases, it was aided by and supported by industry collaborators. Um, and then once clinical trials began and the pivotal clinical trials were done and the regulatory process went through, um, obviously industry became closely involved, but at this point both industry and academic physicians and scientists um, were, were closely involved in the, in the, um, in the um, development. Um, one common theme that we found um, was of academic scientists conceptualizing this therapeutic approach based on basic research and then actually even going so far as to demonstrating proof of concept. And so, you know, one example was Epitin, um, a uh, synthetic treatment used, uh, used for managing anemia. Um, it had been discovered uh, um, as, a, a, as a protein that existed in the body more than 70 years before it was ultimately isolated in the University of Chicago laboratories of Eugene Goldwasser, who then reportedly also proved its effect um, in a small clinical trial. And then with Goldwasser's help as a consultant, Amgen researchers cloned the gene and were able to develop systems to produce um, a substantial amount of the product that they could then say, um, sell 
sell uh, on the market, and then uh, obviously still today uh, making uh, you know making billions of dollars off the sale um, of this product. A matinib uh, was another example of this. Um, the discovery and, and, and of the efficacy of a matinib came from work at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute from Brian Drucker, um, who set out to try to prove that tyrosine kinase inhibitors could inhibit the BCR tyrosine kinase enzyme that was responsible for chronic myelogenous leukemia. NIH funded research for four decades leading up to this work had identified these chromosomal translocations, and Drucker tested selections from Siba Geige's um, library of tyrosine kinase inhibitors and identified imatinib as having the greatest inhibitory action. Um, and then ultimately, um, also with funding from the uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, demonstrated that it was um, uh, demonstrated as proof of concept and sort of dragged the company into investing in the product, which since which then became a multi-billion dollar a year uh, sales product. Um, another variation of this was that the seminal scientific concepts arose in academic settings. So Prozac, for example, um, the, the idea that you should selectively, uh, um, uh, you should use selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, to try to treat antidepression dates back to the 1960s at universities in, in Sweden. Um, and the first SSRI was actually synthesized then and sold in Europe. It was removed from the market because it was unsafe. But again, this is when uh, Lilly researchers then in the, 19, in the, in the early 70s uh, decided to try to synthesize their own SSRI inhibitor that ended up becoming um, Prozac and a multi-billion dollar seller. And then there are products like the TNF blockers, which again, um, you know, arose based on, uh, on academic science looking at TNF inhibition. It was originally developed as a sepsis product and would have been um, thrown into the garbage heap of history if not for rheuma two rheumatologists in, in London that called up their colleagues at Centacor, got some products to, uh, sent to them, and were able to show that was, this was um, a miracle drug for patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Since the publication of our study, um, more and more examples of potentially transformative drugs have, have come out um, that, that follow this same pattern. And we talked a little bit about, uh, David, David talked well about the CAR-T therapies. Um, you know, the, there is substantial public investment in, in the development of, of the hepatitis C drugs. Um, the gene therapies, uh, you know, Novartis bought the startup um, in 2018 after it created um, the, the, the gene therapy uh, treatment for, for spinal muscular atrophy based on research originating at Ohio State University and Nationwide, Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, there's a gene therapy for X-linked skid that's available in, um, in Europe that was uh, developed based on $25 million of public and charitable funding and basic studies and clinical trials at the French National Institute uh, now being sold for $600,000 a year. Okay, so um, with that as a background, um, what can we do about this? And I wanted to try to set up a landscape of the different options that might be available for accounting for public investment um, in the pricing uh, of drugs. So the first option I would suggest is that we could try to manage pri uh, pricing and access via licensing. And the, you do this, again, via the Buy Dole Act, and this came up um, in Ashley Stevens' presentations and multiple other presentations uh, yesterday, which talked about the Buy Dole Act. But the Buy Dole Act permits ownership of patents arising for federally funded research to remain with inventors and their employers. And then universities uh, negotiate licensing deals that lead to royalty and equity interests, sometimes in the billions of dollars to these universities. But they tend not to include restrictions on pricing or conditions on access. And so what are ways that we could try to implement a, um, a mechanism for pricing and access via licensing? Well, one model is what I would call the UAEM model. UAEM stands for the University's Allies for Essential Medicines, uh, and they were a, real, a grassroots, a real grassroots organization like Patients for Affordable Drugs um, that, that, that was developed around this idea of, of university-funded research uh, that led to important HIV medications that were not made available um, uh, in low-income countries around the world at reasonable prices. And so what they did was their, they, their goal was to encourage tech transfer offices to include international access provisions when licensing their patents for private companies. And in fact, based on their important work, and Peter Maberduke was here yesterday. Is he here today? I don't actually see him in the back. But actually, I do see Zain. Maybe Zain could come up and talk about Zain Rizvi uh, maybe could come up and talk a little bit about UAEM in the, in the Q&A session. Um, but uh, several leading universities, as a result of UAEM's work, did agree to negotiate these provisions uh, and, and, uh, or to avoid enforcing patents in some low-income countries. And, I get, and, and guess what? The university tech transfer system did not collapse. After these, uh, after these kinds of provisions were instituted. Now, again, the limitations of this approach are that these markets are not really revenue generating uh, for pharmaceutical companies, and of course, these voluntary limits did not apply to developed countries. 
Okay, so what's another model that we could use? Another model that we could use is a reasonable pricing clause model. And again, this goes back to discussions yesterday about the NIH that used to have a reasonable pricing clause um, starting in 1989 attached to um, CRADA agreements between the government and outside institutions. And this was the text of the um, uh, reasonable pricing clause. Um, and so, unfortunately, this, this was implemented poorly, and in fact, the NIH, even during the years when the, the reasonable pricing clause was in fa intact, didn't fully implement it for some of the important drugs that came out during that time, like Taxol, and um, Amit, uh, I think, discussed this yesterday in his comments, and he's going to have a paper coming out on this, uh, showing the history of this in some great detail very soon. Um, but it was also withdrawn because of subjective uh, industry pushback uh, in 1995. But again, as, uh, as Amit pointed out and as David pointed out, there is no actual objective evidence of any chilling effect um, that, this, um, that this had, despite the fact that there is substantial subjective uh, testimony around that time that it was a concern. A third model is what I would call the NCVIA model. NCVIA stands for the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. So in the 1980s, because we uh, were concerned that litigation would drive vaccine manufacturers out of the market, the National Childhood Vaccine Industry, um, uh, in Injury Act was created uh, to create a no-fault compensation system for individuals injured a following a vaccine administration. It paid for this system via an excise tax of 75 cents per dose of vaccine sold, and it is maintained to this day. And so why is this relevant? And I think this is relevant because a, we could imagine new legislation that would be, that would be a, a approved for all drugs based on a patent declaring government support, and then um, uh, impose an excise tax uh, of some small amount on the sales of this product that could then be recycled into in NIH funding to help identify the next generation of treatments, or as Professor, or as Professor Danzen um, indicated, uh, use that as a way of setting a price ceiling for such drugs, um, may, whether it be based on the uh, cost effectiveness analysis or some other threshold. Uh, obviously, the limitation of this approach is that it would require some congressional authorization. What is the scope of such an approach? We have a paper coming out in BMJ uh, um, in a few months in which we show how many patents uh, approved, how many drugs approved in the last 10 years had patents that we could track, at least one patent that we could track based uh, on some public investment. And we found that about 25% of recently approved drugs are relating to, uh, relate to a patent that originated in a, uh, an academic setting or a spinoff from an academic setting. Um, and I would point out that this is an increase from 5% uh, in the 1980s um, and 14% from uh, Ashley Stevens' papers in the 1990s and early 2000s. And so we're, we're seeing an increased reliance on, uh, on, on um, intellectual property arising in government-funded sources, whether that's because um, academic settings are patenting more or because a lot of pharmaceutical companies are divesting from their uh, basic and translational science researchers that's going on within their you know, uh, companies and are instead um, outsourcing and purchasing in um, uh, um, a lot of a lot of these products is um, you know remains to be seen. The second option I think that we might have is pricing and access via uh, action under current laws. And again, this goes back to the Bay Dole Act, which has a section that provides a, a, um, a paid uh, patent back to the, that exists already back in the government uh, for a non-exclusive royalty-free license that already exists. Marchin rights under the Bay Dole Act already exist if the drugs are not made available on reasonable terms. I think Professor Thomas uh, talked about this in, in, um, you know, in, in some good detail yesterday. Um, but you know, high prices make products effectively unavailable, and this is part of the reasonable terms that might reasonably. And I think if you look at the, at the history of the legislation in the 1970s, even before the specific legislation itself, this was intended to be part uh, of, of the uh, act itself, and this could be part of the. Uh, um, this could be implemented better. Now, I would point out that the limitations of this model is that the fundamental contributions in, in many cases uh, that, that the uh, you know, uh, NIH makes to drug development may not rise to the level of patenting. And there's a famous example um, of the COXIBs, the selective um, COX-2 inhi inhibitors that were developed based on research that occurred um, at the University of Rochester, showing that this selective inhibition could help with pain control, and then actually developing an assay to try to uh, understand which drugs would have the selective inhibition, um, but then um, from a came in, used this assay on its library, got a product that it was able to take to market and sell for billions of dollars. Um, and when Rochester tried to sue to indicate that their patent um, was, was uh, you know, that this drug um, was related to their patent, was shown not to have um, the same kinds of, uh, not to have uh, any intellectual property control over this final product. And again, I would also point out, as Ashley Stevens pointed out yesterday, that um, 
the, the uh, Archon rights have never been um, implemented in the pharmaceutical context, even when a drug became available, as in the case of the Fabry's disease drug. Um, although when it has been invoked, um, it has been used to help lower drug prices, and I would point out the ritonavir example as another example. Finally, um, I think we could talk about, um, uh, about drug general drug pricing and access reform. Um, it's important to recognize that drug prices are set in the U.S. based on what the market will bear and are not based in any way on the drug development costs or other value of the product, and negotiation by the government is prohibited. So if we did uh, uh, undertake legislation, and again, these are currently under, under consideration, to allow the government to establish the clinical value of new drugs and effectively negotiate drug prices, then we could account for all of this just by virtue of reforming the, um, the drug pricing system, whether or not the, the U.S. government was shown to have a, a direct patent connection to the particular product. And you can see models for this in, in, in many other uh, countries' health technology assessment organizations. And then finally, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going over by a, a minute, but, um, but finally I would point out that we haven't actually mentioned this today, but there is a safety net that exists in the current law out there, um, Section 1498, or government patent use, which is the eminent domain equivalent um, in the intellectual property space, allows the government to use patented inventions without permission but I would point out while paying the patent holder reasonable and entire compensation. This has been used in the context, usually in the Department of Defense, um, um, but you know, when it's been done, royalties are set by the court relating to 10% of sales. And you can imagine a um, 1498 patent buyout system where you could uh, you know, account for the uh, costs of development, the costs of failure, and even provide a bounty for particularly important innovation in cases of really important public health um, uh, need. And we have a paper in uh, Health Affairs uh, with my colleague Amy Kapczynski uh, where we talk about this in the context of sofosivir and then a follow-up paper in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics where we talk about this in the context of, uh, of the anti-opioid drug naloxone. Okay, so then just to sum up, um, we need new drug treatments for numerous unmet medical needs and we need publicly funded basic and translational science to prosper since these form the basis of most transformative, uh, transformational drugs and the riskiest part of drug development. Private investors in avoid this risk and large manufacturers are increasingly disengaging from this stage. We need to ensure sufficient incentives for private manufacturers that help shepherd the majority of modern drugs and vaccines through clinical trials, um, but the current approach is fiscally unsustainable and is unfair to taxpayers who unwrite so much of this research. Um, and of course, as David pointed out, patients are suffering um, from high prices and lack of access. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.